Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Lieberman, Food and Beverage Practice Leader at FOA and Son Insurance Brokers, and welcome to Episode 5 of FOA and Son's Food for Thought. Uh, this is our monthly webcast where we tackle a different risk management topic, all related to the food and beverage industry. Uh, this month is dedicated to food and beverage importers, or really, in fact, anyone who relies on ocean carriers to transport uh, finished goods or raw materials. Um, we are talking about the alarming increase in container losses due to rough seas. Uh, we've seen a number of uh, losses over the past few months, um, all uh, in the North Pacific route. Uh, today, my invited guest is Michael Hurd. Uh, Michael is the director at WK Webster. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for joining us here on episode five of Food for Thought. You're very welcome, Michael. I'm, I'm very happy to be here and talk about this. It's, it's a good opportunity. Great. Thank you, Michael. So Michael and I, uh, we recorded our discussion last week. Uh, we'll switch over to that recorded discussion shortly. After the recorded discussion, uh, I would ask everyone to please stay tuned. Uh, we are going to come back for a live Q&A to answer any questions that you may have. Um, any questions that you have, please use the, uh, the chat tool on Zoom. Uh, we are also streaming this on Facebook Live and we will be monitoring Facebook as well for any questions that pop up there. Um, to moderate today's Q&A, we have Patty Devine here. Patty, uh, say hello to the audience if you're there. Hi, everybody. Just getting ready for the Q&A. Looking forward to it after the chat. All right, so Patty, um, as always, just wanna thank you for all the work that you and your team have done uh, to bring this production to light. Thank you so much. Um, I also want to just tell the audience um, another reason to stay tuned for the Q&A. We will be awarding uh, one lucky viewer uh, with a special gift from Italy. Uh, if you don't know about Italy, please check them out at Italy.com. Um, so we have a great presentation for you today. Um, please sit back, uh, relax, and enjoy episode five of Food for Thought. On November 30th, 2020, Ocean Liner 1 Apis encountered heavy seas, ultimately leading to one of the worst cargo losses on record. It is reported that over 1,800 containers have been lost at sea. Since then, various other losses, most involving the same North Pacific route, have occurred. We now approach 3,000 lost containers in just a short three-month period. What is the reason behind the uptick in losses? How is the shipping industry addressing these issues? And what do owners of goods need to know if they find themselves impacted by this type of unfortunate event? I'm Michael Lieberman, Food and Beverage Practice Leader at FOA and Son Insurance Brokers, and this is Food for Thought. Today's guest on Food for Thought is Michael Hurd. Michael is a director at WK Webster and heads up its casualty and recoveries departments from the UK. Prior to joining WK Webster, Michael spent over 20 years at one of the international group P&I clubs, where he was a director, partner, and head of claims. Michael, therefore, has a wealth of experience over a very broad range of marine liability areas, including cargo, collisions, marine pollution, hull machinery, ports and terminals, just to name a few. WK Webster has been offering marine and transit claims and consultancy services worldwide since 1861 and is widely considered to be the leader in its field. It employs a staff of over 230 colleagues at its hub offices in the UK, US, and Singapore, providing innovative claims and consultancy solutions to a broad and impressive list of clientele around the globe, made up of both insurer and corporate clients. These clients include some of the world's leading insurers, in addition to a number of well-known brands in the food and beverage sector. I would like to thank the team at Italy who stepped up to help surprise our guest with a gift. Our guest, Michael Hurd, is a lover of Italian cuisine, and there is no better way to satisfy your Italian food cravings than to take a trip to an Italy marketplace. It is truly the wonderland of Italian food. Italy is about eating Italian food, living the Italian way. Thank you so much to the team at Italy. So Michael, thank you so much for joining us here today on Food for Thought, this is episode five, and this is a very timely topic that we're talking about today. I do wanna first mention that we, our firms, FOA and Son and WK Webster, uh, we do have something in common 
Um, do, you, do you know what that is by chance? Oh, I don't. It's not just our, our first names, although there, it is that too. But uh, yeah, we, I noticed the other day, we, we were both essentially founded on, in the same year, 1861. So we're both in this year on our 160th anniversaries, which is an incredible coincidence. It, it sure is. So our, our listeners today are in for a big treat because they are getting, I think that works out to about 320 years of combined marine cargo experience uh, coming at them today through this, uh, through this web series. So uh, yes, uh, happy anniversary to WK Webster, your 160th anniversary. And to you, and to you. Um, so today, Michael, we are tackling the topic, and again, this is a very timely topic, of, of cargo losses. So we have seen a lot of news recently about the seemingly uptick in containers going overboard. Um, and of course, with the way news travels today, social media outlets, in some cases, you know, there, there may be the appearance of something that is outside of the norm. Um, uh, have you found that there is a identifiable increase in these types of claims, specifically containers being lost at sea going overboard? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if one just looks at the last three months experience, we've seen five stroke six ships encounter essentially the same issue and not only the same issue but on the same shipping route essentially the north pacific route from china to uh, the west coast of the us it started in november um there was a ship called the one aquila which lost about 100 containers a little more than 100 um, and then there was a very very large one the one apis mm. which reportedly has lost over 1800 containers that's most of the deck stone gone or collapsed on onto the deck um, there were three others the ever liberal the er tianping and then more recently the one in january the Maersk essen which has lost approximately 750 containers overboard so when you think as a total that's two that's over 2800 containers and when you think that the annual average across the entire globe over the last two years is just short of 1,400 containers lost per year. We've seen double that loss in a three month period in essentially the same ocean route. So th this is not an ordinary situation. Can you pinpoint anything that's happening in the shipping industry that could be causing uh, this uptick? The typical areas that we would look to analyze is first and foremost, the, the bad weather. At the source of all of these cases is the vessels hit some some bad weather um, and so and without which you'd say this wouldn't happen i mean that is that is undeniably true i think however uh, it's not just about uh, weather in fact, in fact the weather isn't really that severe um for for these ships to cope with but but yes there's some bad weather but then we look at what the vessel does to mitigate the effects of the weather does it change course direction speed how does it deal with the onset of of bad weather with all of the navigational aids and all of the weather reporting services that they get what did they do to try and avoid or reduce the effects of the weather we look at the loaded condition of the vessel when it set sail was it essentially seaworthy was it was it, was it within the, the, the limits of its stability calculations etc you know what did it look like when it sailed that's a factor an important factor is especially in the container trade is commercial expediency. Um, you know, these lines, they run to very tight schedules. They're in, they're in the business of making money, but also providing a service. And when you're heading at 16 knots into bad weather, who has the overriding decision there as to whether you just carry on going, because you've got to make it. You've got to make it to LA before Christmas, <laughs> you know. You, you can't afford not to so what what impact does that have there are ship design issues which is a really important factor on these uh, on these latest losses these these massive ultra large container ships some of which the largest of which are sort of 400 meters long and 60 meters across their beam width you know they're they're enormous they're they're it'd be like laying the empire state building on its side they're, they're, they're that size 
Now, obviously, the shipping lines have invested a lot of money into these larger vessels. So I can't imagine that we're going to go backwards and go back to, to smaller vessels. But do you know of anything, uh, you know, any steps that the liners are taking to avoid these losses from happening again? Um, it, it does it go back to just, uh, you know, being smarter about moving around these storms, not encountering the rough weather? Um, or, or are they going to start shrinking the, the stack size um, so you don't have this violent, you know, rocking uh, in, in rougher seas? Well, you're absolutely right. These ships, they cost an awful lot of money. They're, they're huge. And it must be a, quite a disappointment to the ship owners to find that they don't behave terribly well in bad weather always, having invested all of that money. But that's not going to change, right? You know, this is the new norm. Um, so something's got to give, and it is going to be a combination of factors. Yes, you could reduce the stack heights, for example. You could do that. You know, you could. That, that's one of many factors. Um, you could do it just in the winter time, perhaps. You know, you could say, well, you know, in in the bad weather routes in the winter, maybe you need to be carrying a little bit less. Maybe you need to be paying a little bit more attention to your stack heights, your securing arrangements. There, there are definitely things that can be done to um, you know, if things are done properly, this, this really shouldn't happen. It's, for, for the most part, these incidents are avoidable. Um, uh, and uh, they come about by a number of different failures. But for sure, they can't change certain things. But, you know, the design of the ships and the effect that that has in the, in the weather is, is, is always going to be a, an issue. But certainly they can take steps to reduce these occurrences. If shippers don't have enough to worry about already, right? Worrying about their containers going overboard or God forbid we go back to the days when we see an increase in uh, vessel fires. Um, shippers have also been dealing with the economic impacts uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we've also seen a shortage in containers. We've seen a recirculation of what I would classify to be older equipment coming back into the scene to, to make up for those shortages. Um, do you believe that plays a role in any of what we're seeing today with these container losses? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, all, everything you've just mentioned, all of these things are interrelated. Right? I mean, when the, the COVID pandemic started, I thought lots of bad things were going to happen. People were going to fall ill, people were going to die. I didn't actually think that containers were going to fall off ships as a result of COVID. But essentially, that's what we're seeing here. All of these things are connected. Yeah, let's talk about the one Apis uh, situation. Um, there are so many owners of goods who may not have had physical loss or damage to their product. But nonetheless, their product was delayed. Um, how long of a process when, when something like this happens? I think it would be important for our listeners to understand uh, how long the process can play out. Um, you know, these vessels need to be, you know, rerouted to different ports. The unloading process can take quite some time. I don't know the specifics on how long it has taken to offload the one Apis. Um, you know, and, and there are goods, especially in the food and beverage industry, that may have a short shelf life. Uh, you run into issues of delay. You know, from a marine cargo insurance standpoint, that is a paramount exclusion. Right? We are not going to pay losses due to delay. Now, of course, that coverage can be designed back in um, for those who are dealing with perishables or, or those who are dealing with a short shelf life product. Um, you can design that coverage in for a premium. Um, but can you just walk us through the timeline of, uh, you know, I, I heard some alarming reports that it, it, it took, uh, you know, somewhere around 20 days to offload, you know, 100 containers from the one Apis. Um, that is incredibly slow. Um, do you have any insight on that? Yeah, you're right. It's still going on now. I mean, this the one Apis, I think that occurred on the 30th of November, I believe, and it, it turned back towards Kobe in Japan, arriving, I think, on about the 8th of December from memory. Uh, and some days, you know, it discharges, you know, a handful of containers. But this isn't this isn't an easy task. I don't I don't really criticize the the owners for this. I mean, normally you'd you'd send a gantry crane would go over and the spread would come down and it'd lock on and it'd pick it up and it'd move it off and it all happens very very quickly but when everything is collapsed you can't do that so you need um slings and chains to get them through the corner 
castings or underneath the containers. A lot of the containers are completely damaged. You know, the floors will fall out, the sidewalls, everything will start to fall to bits. So it's a, it's a dangerous and it's a long-winded operation. It's still ongoing now, and it's likely to take another few weeks before the one apis is discharged. Now, we keep on hearing about general average um, or the possibility of general average being declared uh, in, in any of these, these uh, cases that we've seen over the past few months. Um, what's your thought on general average? Uh, you know, do, you, do you think that there's going to be a declaration of, G of GA? Um, but also for our listeners, it would probably be very helpful if you could just also explain what general average is. Yeah, I'll do, I'll do that to begin with, because, you know, to, to me and to you, this is something that we deal with uh, as part of our jobs. But for, for your listeners, this is probably these are probably two words that mean very little to them, perhaps. So so general average is it's an ancient um, concept that goes back th literally thousands of years. But general average occurs when um, there is extraordinary expense or sacrifice that is incurred to preserve from peril the property in the common maritime adventure. That is essentially the classic definition of general average. But what that means in real terms is if the ship owner, doesn't have to be the ship owner, but it's normally the ship owner because he's in control, has to spend money or sacrifice property, normally cargo, by jettisoning it overboard to save the voyage, then what is sacrificed or spent is essentially shared amongst all of the property interests, the ship and the cargo owners, in proportion to the values on board. Essentially, you know, you want your ship to be, you want this voyage to be saved, everyone's got a share in that expense. So losing containers overboard doesn't necessarily imperil the entire maritime adventure. It may imperil the cargo, but is it imperiling the ship? So there's a question mark essentially over whether these incidents were sufficiently severe to uh, fall within the definition of, of, of general average. But actually, and for some other reasons, actually, even if they did, um, we don't think we're going to see a declaration of general average for either the one apus or the Merck Essen. In fact, I'm pretty sure we're not there. Okay. And I think it's also important to uh, let the listeners know that general average and, and the cost associated with general average when it is declared is something that is covered by marine cargo insurance. Uh, typically with no deductible uh, uh, applying. Um, so any shipper out there who does not have marine cargo insurance because you think the loss will never happen to you, just know that you could be pulled into a general average situation, which uh, you know makes purchasing marine cargo insurance uh, maybe a little more appetizing. Um, so, you know, moving away from this type of this type of loss, you know, containers overboard. Uh, I know we here at Foe and Son and our loss control department, who's uh, headed up by um, Nicole Brandy in our office, we do a lot of work trying to uh, provide preventative measures that our clients can take uh, when shipping goods uh, to minimize the risk of loss. Um, so, I would love to get your thoughts. Uh, yeah, so you can share with the audience on some guidance that you may have uh, when it comes to loss prevention, um, you know, measures that, you know, our listeners can take when they're shipping goods to uh, minimize the possibility of a negative event. In, in the containerized business, the first thing obviously to do is to check quite carefully the condition of the container as it's delivered to you for loading. That sounds, it sounds obvious. Um, but so often it's not done. Uh, it's not done well. Have a look at its general condition. Is it old? Is it is it rusty? Look for holes um, that might let in water, essentially. And and how do you do that? I mean, you could you step into the container, you close the doors, and you do a light test. Even small holes will shine through a little shard of light through the container roof if it's rusted or it's damaged. Um, you can you can spray water. You can do a we'll call a water test and see if any water um, comes through. So you can do um, things like that. Look at the look at the, the the rubber door gaskets. Make sure that they're not compressed or perished because there's another source of um, uh, of, of, of water. Look at look at the look at the floor and the walls, the timber floor in particular. Is it clean? Um, Check it for dirt, for, for debris, for any spillages, especially in the, in the food and beverage industry. This is really important, right? Because 
we act for a number of um, household names in the food and beverage industry and um, we know from our experience that you know if you if you've got something that's tainted by odor a chemical odor perhaps that's it it's gone you know you're not going to be able to put that on the shelves so it's really really important in 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 the food and beverage sector to make sure that the container is clean it's odor free look for evidence of insect infestation and we're amazed at how often again particularly in the food and beverage sector when you see infestation by insects ants and such like so look for any evidence of uh, of that look at the container corner castings these are the bits this is the structure of the container the panels are just metal panels but the corner castings these are the things that hold the container to the ship. If they're cracked or heavily rusted, then you might find that they just pull away from the twist locks on the, on the ship and you've got, a, you've got a problem. So look at the, uh, the, uh, the corner castings. So that, that all goes to the sort of the condition of the container really, but what's really then vital is how the containers are packed. Um, they've got to be packed adequately to withstand the rigors of sea carriage and that's again stating the obvious but it's not uh it's not always a straightforward uh task so securing cargo within containers is is essentially the main point if you're going to put boxes loosely packed in a container they're going to fly around during the normal um rigors of uh, of, a, of a sea carriage and you're going to have damaged cargo and there is a code on this the imo produce a code the ctu code which is a voluntary code, but it gives all sorts of guidance on how to pack containers, um, how to block and brace the cargo using timber chocks and straps and chains and, and wires and um, reducing friction between pallets and the different materials that you can use to try and keep cargo essentially stationary um, in, in a container. You know, there's nets and strapping and you know, there's an awful lot that can be done to ensure um, safe carriage. What I would say from my um, perspective is, if you can, take photos as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we've, all, we've all got phones now that take photos. So, you know, as you load a container, take a photo of it once it's complete or even midway and then towards the end. So you have evidence of how well it's been packed. Because traditionally what happens is if cargo is damaged if the container is sound but you open the doors at the other end and it's damaged the shipping line will say well it wasn't adequately stowed was it it was there was obviously a problem with the way this cargo was was packed um we need the evidence so if you've got photos at the load port of really when it was when it was originally stuffed of a really good stow that is really helpful to us looking to recover that loss from the uh, from the shipping line and it takes it takes seconds it takes seconds to do yeah, it takes seconds to do, or you know, shippers can hire third-party you know uh, surveyors to do pre-shipping condition reports, um, and they can do all that work for you. Yeah, of course they can do that. That's that's uh, that's always uh, a good thing to do. But of course, that comes at a cost. Not everyone wants to to incur that cost, but you can do much of it yourself. Um, you know, we see there are issues around things like condensation. If you've ever, you must have seen certain containers being moved between certain areas of the world and and sure the, the, the timber that you use can give off so much you know, timber pallets and packaging can use so it can give off so much condensation that the roof panel is absolutely dripping and again in the food and beverage industry if you've got wet labeling on drums or jars or boxes you can't sell that stuff so right. um you know so we use dried timber some some even use uh, plastic packaging rather than wooden to try and reduce the incidence of uh, of condensation. And then there are things like um, you know shock detectors, temperature detectors, th devices that you can put in sure. with your car to sure. monitor uh, to monitor all of that. On, so there's on, lots there's lots that can be done. On, on episode one of Food for Thought, we actually tackled the cold chain and we talked about the use of time temperature recording devices for refrigerated cargo. Um, and how helpful that is to pinpoint where and when uh, temperature abuse occurred. Um, you know, when it comes to temperature abuse, I've also seen a rise in cases. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the flat walled containers. They are supposedly the more eco-friendly containers. Um, but you, know, you don't have the corrugated container uh, channels anymore. 
Mm. So you have these frozen cases packed straight up against the, the wall of these flat wall containers and it's not allowing for the proper airflow around the product. So even though the reefer unit is working properly, you know, everything surrounding that container exterior is being hit by the hot sun and you're, you're baking, you're getting these hot pockets within the container. So I've been a, a big advocate of telling my clients, you know, make sure that you provide, you know, you, you have your packers put the spacers, you know, in there to allow for that, that proper airflow. Exactly right. Yeah, air channels on refrigerator cargo is is an important. You've got to let the air, the cold air, flow. You've got to pre-cool your container. This this is a subject matter in itself, frankly, isn't it, Mike? I mean, this is it. It sure is. This for an hour, an hour just by itself. It sure is. Well, Michael, you have been very helpful, and I really do appreciate you sharing your expertise. Um, you know, during our workup to this discussion, I did ask you a question about uh, your your favorite food item or favorite type of food. Uh, do you do you recall your answer? Yeah, I think I said that, I, that my favorite my favorite regional food, I guess, is Italian. That's right. And it's not it's not just because the origins of your firm are are Italian. <laughs> well, look, it's become a tradition here on Food for Thought uh, that we provide our guest speakers with a gift. Um, so knowing that you're, 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 you're a fan of Italian food, uh, we reached out to, uh, to Italy. Uh, Italy is pretty much the paradise when it comes to Italian food. They have locations all around the globe. And uh, Michael, we learned from Italy that they are opening a brand new location uh, in London. Mm -hmm. So you are going to be one of the first, if not the first, uh, to receive a Italy gift card to use at that London location. So we just want to thank you. We hope you enjoy that. And uh, we also want to thank the folks at Italy for, for help, helping us, uh, you know, get this gift to you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to you. Thank you to them. And uh, it's been my pleasure today to talk to you about these things. All right, Michael, take care. Thanks very much. Thank you, Len. Thanks to all for joining us here on Food for Thought. A huge thank you to my guest, Michael Hurd. And thanks to Italy for helping us provide a special gift to our guest. To all of our viewers, please check out Italy by visiting their website at Italy.com. To continue the conversation on marine cargo losses, marine insurance, and loss prevention, please reach out to me by phone or email. I look forward to hearing from you. And finally, Thank you to all of our FOA and Sun Value clients for allowing us to serve your risk management and your insurance needs. It's our honor to play a role in your food and beverage journey and your success. I'll see you next time on Food for Thought. Hello, everyone. So here we are back at the live Q&A. Uh, we certainly hope you got some valuable insights out of that discussion. Um, of course, the conversation that Michael and I had probably lasted well over an hour, uh, and we had to condense it down to 30 minutes, so I'm sure there are some questions out there. Um, Michael, I know that you and I kind of are somewhat conflicted about talking about this, this topic, mainly because, you know, from a owner of goods perspective, there's only so much that an owner of, uh, of goods shipping these containers on these large vessels can do when it comes to these types of events. But I think it's more about just awareness. Um, I hope our listeners got that sense of awareness of that, that one, these things happen, and two, what does the process look like if you're involved in one of these negative uh, events? So, um, so Patty, um, I know you were monitoring uh, questions coming in either via Zoom or via Facebook Live. Um, do we have any questions from the audience that we can address? Um, we do, and I'm gonna start kind of in the middle. Um, Susan uh, is asking, she's an importer of fresh fruit. Um, so when there's you know, significant delays due to collapse, shipment spoils, is there coverage available for losses? Okay, um, so we, we did address this during our call briefly and uh, it, it's a topic that's definitely deserving of more time. Um, but when it comes to delay, um, delay is what is known as a paramount exclusion within marine cargo policies. So you may have an all risk of physical loss or damage policy. Um, however, if there's physical loss or damage due to delay, those types of losses are excluded. However, 
when someone is shipping fresh, a product like fresh produce, where a delay can have significant impacts, there is a way in which you can design coverage back in for delay. Um, there's, there's really two things to think about though when it comes to delay. You have delay that leads to physical damage, which there is a possibility of arranging coverage for that. Um, it would come at an additional premium in most cases. Um, but then you also have delay that leads to loss of market, right? So you may have, um, you know, if we stay in the food and beverage space, let's think about chocolate bunnies that are being sold for the Easter holiday. Um, if there's a delay where you can't get those bunnies to market, there's no damage due to the delay. You just lost the opportunity to sell those bunnies at the highest possible price because you missed the Easter holiday. So you have, you really have to separate those two things, damage that leads to, de um, or delay that leads to damage of your product. Yes, you can arrange coverage. Uh, you need to work with your broker in arranging that, a broker who really knows how to negotiate those coverage terms. Um, but then you also have to think about uh, delay that leads to loss of market. And that is a little more tricky to find underwriters who would be willing to take on that type of risk. Michael, in your capacity, um, do you have any insight or thoughts on this topic? Um, well, yeah, you've kind of explained it all really, but you're, you're right. The standard coverage terms exclude liability for delay, even if, uh, or losses caused by delay, even if the, the sort of the starting point of the event is a, is a covered uh, incident. Uh, delay claims that generally fall outside of cover, but you're right, you have to look at individual policies and see what's covered and, and what is not. That's right. And I, I think when you're when you're thinking about these situations like containers going overboard uh, and, and having to reroute those uh, vessels to different ports and the long unloading process that will ensue, yes, you're going to run into these delays. And if you have a product uh, that is going to, you know, eventually become damaged because of that, that longer time frame it's sitting in that container, you would almost better off, be better off having your container go overboard, uh, which is a, yeah. a far more uh, simple claims adjustment uh, than when you're dealing with strictly delay leading to damage. So um, uh, Susan, I believe that question came from Susan. Susan, great question. And hopefully that, uh, that you know, provides you some clarity on that topic. Great, thanks, Michael. Um, so Mark has a question. Uh, does a surveyor have any input on whether or not a claim is recoverable under cargo insurance? I'll, I'll deal with that, shall I, I think so. I, I think it's appropriate answer. for you, Michael, for sure. Yeah. I think the simple answer is no. I mean, surveyors are a very important part of the investigation process into losses, but they are there to investigate and to report. Um, They're not generally there to decide on questions of liability and coverage. Uh, we partner with our uh, insurer clients and those decisions are made uh, by those insurers and sometimes with some guidance from us, but the surveyor is there to report and investigate and that is normally the limit of their, of their authority. Now, Michael, one thing on surveyors and their involvement in the claims process, um, do you have anything to add uh, in regards to salvage, um, you know, where surveyors may become involved in arranging salvage offers from, from salvage buyers. Yeah, quite right. So, I mean, WK Webster has its own uh, in-house survey company and quite a lot of their time is often spent arranging for salvage sales and <clears throat> inviting um, bids on damaged or, uh, or, or discrepant goods, essentially. So, uh, that is a, an important part in mitigating loss and and all cargo owners when they suffer uh, an insured loss are under a general duty to mitigate their loss you can't sit and, and wait for losses to exacerbate by taking no action so the surveyors that were appointed will uh, generally help in in uh, giving guidance and arranging for salvage sales if that is what is required great thanks michael Patty, any other questions? Uh, I have two more, if you have the time. Uh, the first one is from Elizabeth. If general average is declared, who is responsible? The shipper or the consignee? I don't know how to say it. Consignee. 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 Yeah. Well, this is, um, this is a, a bit of a, uh, a complicated topic. Um, it, it, Michael, it sounds like you have something to say, but you know, I've, 
you know, the, it depends, my answer to this question is it all really depends on the, the INCO terms that have been used. Uh, that needs to be looked at very, very clearly. Um, I actually had a situation uh, with a client where they were shipping um, uh, containers of frozen shrimp um, and they were sending them to, to uh, China. And they were selling those containers on terms uh, where the buyer or the consignee had title and risk of loss uh, of those goods the moment they were in the possession of the steamship company. Um, however, my client had not been paid for those goods, right? So there was still a financial interest uh, connected with, with that product. Um, the goods were placed on the vessel. Um, something did occur. I don't remember the details of what led to the declaration of general average, uh, but something clearly happened to the vessel where the, the vessel incurred additional expenses to save the voyage um, and, and general average was declared. Um, in that case, it would have been the consignee who was responsible based on the INCO term, um, but the consignee in this case really just kind of threw up their hands and said, we're not dealing with it. And it fell back on the shipper who based on the INCO term didn't have the responsibility, didn't have the risk of loss. Um, and we, we got involved in somewhat of an arm twisting exercise with the insurer to back uh, the shipper of these goods um, through various clauses within a marine policy that, that put the insurer on risk for that. Um, but yes, I think in this situation, you really need to look at the INCO term, understand who has title, who has risk of loss. Um, and typically it's that party who is responsible for the GA. Um, Michael? Yeah, I mean, all of that is, is quite, quite right. It's, it's normally the owner of the goods. And, and so the INCO terms are important, but, but looking slightly beyond that aspect, that is often relevant to, to the question of who has to put up a general average bond to, uh, the, to the, uh, the general average adjuster or, or the owner of the ship, essentially, to secure the, uh, the payment of whatever is due from that cargo in general average. Um, but, but the more important document to, to, to that general average bond is the general average guarantee provided by the insurer. And essentially, uh, provided the cargo is properly insured, for that risk, um, then um, ultimately when the, the general average adjustment is, is um, produced and contributions are collected, it will be by reference to the general average guarantee provided by the insurer, which is going to be the paramount document and questions of, uh, of who is in theory responsible between shipper and consignee, they don't exactly fall away because someone's insurance has got to respond. And uh, if there's a seller's interest, um, clause in a, in, a, in a policy that responds to the unpaid seller, given the example you've just uh, given to us, Michael, then, then maybe that responds as opposed to the consignee's insurance if, if he had the obligation to insure the, the voyage. But where there is insurance, hopefully that will um, step in essentially to, to respond to, to, the, to the general average liability if, if there is a liability to pay. All right, so, so Elizabeth, uh, thank you for asking that question. Uh, it seems like a simple question, but uh, somewhat of a complicated answer. So of course, if, you, if you're not clear on that, please feel free to reach out to, uh, to us and we'll be happy to provide more clarity. Uh, Patty, uh, another question? Yeah, we have one last question and uh, I think we can wrap it up in, in five minutes or so if you guys don't talk too long. Well, we also have the Italy gift for our one lucky viewer we need let's to get to. That so right now we, before the last question. Let's do, let's do the last question then we'll get to the, okay. we'll get to the Italy gift. Okay, sounds good. Uh, just to keep people hanging on. Okay, so um, this is actually from um, one of our listeners in Germany um, who happens to work with us. We know who that is. Um, and he's wondering just overall, like how do these losses impact the marine cargo insurance market? You know, what's the big picture here? Yeah, I, I mean, look, we don't know how these claims are going to play out yet, right? We, we all of these claims are still under investigation. Uh, we don't know if it's going to be the owner of goods insurance coverage that's going to pay out. We don't know if the vessel insurance is going to pay out. But whatever the case is, we know that these claims are going to hit the marine market very hard. Um, we are already, and we've been talking about this at Foe & Son for you know, the last uh, year or two, we're in a hard market cycle right now. 
you know, after a couple of decades of soft market conditions, uh, we're seeing uh, decreased appetites, uh, we're seeing increased premiums, we're seeing reduction of coverages. Uh, these are some, some of the things that we're dealing with on behalf of our clients. Um, these losses are, are, are definitely gonna have an impact. We don't know exactly how much of an impact at this point, um, but just to put this in perspective, and Michael, you have maybe have more updated numbers than I have at this point, but when looking at just the one APIS, uh, which happened on November 30th, correct? Or was it October 30th, Michael? Uh, November, I believe. Whatever the case is, if just looking at that one event that resulted in uh, damage to, you know, let's call it 1,800 containers, maybe more at this point, um, the estimated loss amount that I understood it to be was $50 million. Um, that's a tremendous hit to the marine cargo insurance marketplace. Um, so it's definitely going to have an impact. Um, we don't know how, how much at this point, uh, but it's something that we're monitoring. Uh, Michael, do you have any insight, not so much on market conditions, but the loss amounts related to these events? Yeah, I mean, I think um, uh, I think 50 million is a, a conservative estimate. My my guess is it's going to be quite a lot more than that for for that particular ship. But we're, we're now looking, and since since our recording, actually, there was a, a yet a, another incident involving another ship, slightly different because there was a reportedly an engine breakdown which resulted in the, uh, the vessel rolling and, and losing some containers. But we're now in excess of 3,000 containers. In three months and and one different people apply different sort of average values to containers um but it's it's going to be a, a large collection of losses and it almost doesn't matter well it does matter where, where it lies but these are insurance losses that are going to lie somewhere with insurers given the nature of reinsurance etc the, these are losses that are going to be borne by the insurance market whether they're paid for by cargo insurers in the first instance and then recovered from the, the ship owners insurances or whether they remain with the cargo insurers their losses are losses and they affect that they affect the market great um all right patty if there are if no more questions came in um let's move on to michael we can't let you be the only person to receive something great from italy um, <laughs> so we have one lucky viewer out there patty i'll turn it over to you sure okay so i've shaking the virtual hat over here uh, while everybody was talking. And um, so it is a gift from Italy and um, Jenny Davis is the winner. She was here earlier and I think she's logged off, but um, we will send her an email and get her mailing information so that we can send her a gift from yes. Italy. So thank you everybody for attending. And um, it's been a pleasure, it's Michael's. Um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, let wrap it up, Michael. All right, so look, congratulations to Jenny Davis. Uh, thank you for everyone. Uh, thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, Michael, special thank you to you. And of course, a special thank you to Italy. Um, please stay tuned for updates on our next Food for Thought episode uh, for next month. Um, keep a lookout on that and, and we'll start the registration process as soon as possible. Uh, but for now, signing off. And we'll see you next time on Foa and Sons Food for Thought. Take care, everyone. Do, do.